Hi, so uh, like uh, I was introduced, I'm, I'm Josh Schwartz. I, I run the data science uh, team at, at Chartbeat. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, some research that we've done on understanding how users consume content on the web. Um, so I think of this talk as kind of having two goals. Where am I pointing? Let's see. Uh, there we um, Where am I directing this thing toward? There. Okay. So, so I think of this talk as having two goals. So on one hand, if you're a person who cares about web traffic, if, you're, if you generate content, or if you look at web analytics, this talk will give you more detail than you ever wanted to see about how users spend their time on specific pages. Um, and it'll show you something about, I hope, uh, how we can use that understanding of engagement to think about, uh, about trends in traffic a as a whole. Um, if you don't care about, about web traffic at all, I think you can think about this as a story of how you can take very small scale research, scale it up to doing, to kind of handling web scale traffic, and then use that in, in, a, in a product in a way that, that provides value to people. Um, before I jump into that, let me talk a little bit about, uh, give you a little bit of background. So, so Chartbeat is a company, uh, we're based in New York, uh, in Union Square, founded in 2009. Um, and what we do is provide real time analytics to mostly uh, publishing properties. Uh, so we, the sort of information we provide, is we, we say things like, you know, there are 500 people reading this story at this moment, there are 300 people reading this story, and, and so on and so on. And that becomes really useful information if you're an editor and you're trying to make decisions about which stories you should be promoting, on which venues, on which parts of your site, and so on. Um, and these days we're used by the, the overwhelming majority of publishers in North America and, and sort of across the globe. Um, and to sort of talk about the scale of our traffic, we, we handle uh, traffic uh, paid sessions in the billions per day, which sort of breaks down to, uh, you know, our kind of lifetime peak is about 250,000 requests per second that we handle. So t to put a little bit of context around that number, um, Amazon came out with a quote recently that said that, they, that S3 sort of uh, takes in at, at peak about a million requests per second. So we're kind of handling, you know, maybe, maybe a quarter of the requests per second that, that you know, something as big as S3 is handling. Um, so myself, so my background is in uh, sort of uh, kind of the intersection of combinatorial optimization, uh, machine learning, and computer vision. I was a lifelong academic. So I studied at uh, Chicago, Cornell, and MIT before coming to Chartbeat. Um, and these days, like I said, I, I run the data science team at Chartbeat. Um, so today, I'm not really going to be talking about machine learning, combinatorial optimization, or computer vision for that matter. Um, I'm going to be talking about measuring content consumption. So what I mean is we'd like to understand how users spend their time on pages, and we'd like to do that in a way uh, where, for one, we can compare two users' uh, consumption of a given piece of content to each other. So you'd like to be able to say that I read a page differently from somebody else, and you'd also like to be able to compare pages, right? So you'd like to be able to say that uh, this one page, this article, is, is having people read a page a certain way or a certain amount, and this other article is being read less or read differently, right? Um, so faced with that question, the approach that we took, we started off with a small lab study. So what we did is, is we took uh, first, a few dozen users scaled that to a few hundred users, and we did these really controlled studies where, where we took this group of people and we said, okay, what we want you to do is sit down, you're participating in this thing, and you're going to just read this article. Read it however you want, and this, this is, of course, in a, in a web browser. Read it however you want, but just don't stop reading it. Right? And what we did is, is, in the background, we're recording everything that they're doing uh, sort of down to the millisecond. And the way that that data comes out is graphs like this. And I'll sort of expand these so you can, you can see them more in a minute. Um, so, so we got hundreds of, of, of these sort of trains. So, so what's happening here is we're talking about uh, every place that a user did something uh, with the, kind of the console of the computer. So every time a user touched a mouse, or, uh, or touch the key or scroll down the page or up the page. Um, and so these, these trains are kind, of, uh, are kind of marking every individual, at every millisecond, every individual interaction with the, with the computer's console. Um, so we took hundreds of those, we, uh, we clustered them, and, and you get four strong clusters, and I sort of pulled, pulled them out uh, here. So, um, so let's dive into them. So the top left 
we have what I think about is, is active mouse movement. So the black lines, if, if you can make out the colors, are mouse movements. The blue is scrolling, and the, and the red is, is actual uh, typing. Um, so the vast majority of the time, this user actually sort of has their hand on the mouse, right? So, uh, so you see that 80, 90% of, of the total volume of time is, is there, there are mouse movements happening. So this is a person who's reading, and as they're reading, they're sort of scrolling around with their mouse, right? Um, now let's flip through to another person that reads completely differently, right? So this is a user who basically only interacts with the computer by making sort of discrete uh, scrolling keystrokes, right? So they're, they're the person that every once in a while sort of hits the down arrow or the up arrow or the page down arrow or space bar and sort of scrolls down the page, right? Um, so you see that these movements are less frequent but still sort of regular. Um, this is another user that has the same sort of pattern, but is doing that behavior with a mouse rather than with, uh, with a keyboard. So this is a person that's clicking and clicking uh, you know, the down arrow on, on the page instead of scrolling around. And finally, this is, the, this is the smaller cluster of people who typed while they were on the page. So that red uh, in kind of uh, this region is, is, is the user typing. So OK, uh, that's great. It's kind of neat to see, but what does that actually do for us? Well, so one thing that we can do is, uh, is think about how, how, uh, how much kind of white space there is in this graph. So, so if we look at these things, you see that you know, maybe this user spends maybe three seconds when we know that they're reading, because that's kind of the thing we controlled for in the study, but they're not actually doing anything on the page. This user, it's maybe something like seven. This user, it's four. This user, it's three, right? But the point is that, that even the users that are really not you know, interacting with the console much still have only very small gaps uh, in, in their active engagement with the console. So let's look at some distributions of that, right? So on the left, what we have is uh, the, the kind of raw distributions of, of how, how frequently a user interacts with the console. So you see that the vast majority of interactions were less than one second apart. Uh, there are a few people that have uh, gaps that are kind of, you know, gaps in interaction that are one second, and then there are very few interactions that are, that are longer than one second apart. Um, on the right, you know, the, the thing about the, the, uh, the graph on the left is that it's, it's slightly intellectually dishonest because let, let, let's suppose that you had a reader, uh, you know that, that they're reading a, a paragraph that takes, you know, 30 seconds to read. Well, if they are, uh, interacting with the page every second, it'll take 30 of those to sort of fill up that 30 seconds. If they're interacting with the page every you know, 10 seconds, it'll only take three. So sort of counting up the raw counts of the gaps kind of doesn't, doesn't necessarily make that much sense. On the right, we're plotting how much time is spent actively reading with kind of gaps between uh, periods of engagement um, of a certain size. And you see, again, even when we're sort of correcting for the size of the gap, the vast majority of the user's time is still spent with gaps that are very, very small. So why is that interesting? Well, something that, that you note when you look at these distributions is that for 95% of, of readers, 95% of the total time that they actually spend reading is spent with these extremely small gaps, right? So gaps that are smaller than five seconds cover 95% of people and 95% of their time, right? And so what that lets us do then is at any given second, if you haven't seen a user interact with the console in the last five, six seconds, it's very unlikely that they're actually still actively reading at that second. So then you can sort of go along while a user's browsing, and at every second you can say, okay, do I think this user's reading or not? And you can kind of keep a running total of, uh, of, of how, the, how much time you think the user spent. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting thing, but, uh, First of all, you might ask, you know, does that sort of represent something different than maybe just counting how long the user's, you know, been on the page, right? So this is a distribution showing across a few, you know, a few thousand people um, how much, so on the x-axis we have the amount of raw time that the user spent on the page, and on the y-axis we have this, what we call engage time, which is the amount of time that we, we, we saw evidence of active engagement by the user, right? So the first thing to note is that, of course, the amount of time that you've actively been on the page is upper bounded by the amount of time that you've been on the page in some, right? So that's kind of this, you know, this, uh, this you know, line with slope one here, right? 
Um, but what's interesting is that you see that you know, at the beginning of a user's session, the amount of time that they've actually been reading the page is very strongly related to the, the amount of time that they've just been on the page. But there's this divergence. So once we're past you know, a minute, there's really very little relationship, right? And that, of course, makes sense, right? Uh, you know, I probably have four tabs open on my laptop that are you know, sitting in my office uh, idle, where I've been on the page for hours, but I, I'm not interacting with them, right? Um, but the interesting thing that comes out of that is that over 80% of the time that people are actually on pages, they're not really interacting with them. So the, the point is that, that kind of collecting wall clock time and looking at that as a metric of, of, of kind of how users spend time is, is, is not a particularly relevant statistic. To sort of see that in another way, let's look at, at another kind of metric you might use for engagement. So what we're showing here is on the, on the x-axis, we have the amount of time that a user's been actively scrolling. And on the y-axis, we, we have uh, how far down the page they've gotten, right? So you see that there's a pretty strong relationship between these. In some sense, that's almost tautologically true, right? Because if, if one thing that we count as an active engagement is moving around the page, then uh, of course, people who have moved down the page more will have more time that they've been engaged with the page, right? But nonetheless, there's a positive trend. So, so we see that, 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 that there's some relationship that's pretty strong between, uh, between time, on page, time actively on page and how far down the page you get. Um, let's look at that in terms of kind of wall clock time rather than this engage time. You see that there's basically no relationship, right? Um, if you're curious about this kind of vertical striping, that's because wall clock time is being measured in 15 second increments here. Um, so, uh, so you see, I mean, there, there's some sort of pattern where people just tend to, it's a little bit denser over here. People spend less time on pages in general. People scroll down pages less in general. But, but for the most part, there, there's very little correlation when we, when we compare it to this measurement. Um, and I guess based on, on that stuff, what I'd argue is that uh, if you kind of think about these as, as three metrics that we might potentially use to understand how a user is spending time on a page, so first of all, we have kind of raw time, right, wall clock time. And we've seen that that just isn't particularly relevant to understanding what a user's experience on a page is. Scroll, um, so how far down a page a person uh, moves, to me in some sense is kind of the gold standard for, for how a user consumes a page. So you know, saying like, I read to pixel 2,000, you read to pixel 3,000, it seems like we can really say that you've read more of a story. The problem with scroll is that it's, it's, it's kind of dependent on design, right? So if you have somebody with a responsive layout where when I see the article, it's 3,000 pixels high, and when you see the article, it's 2,000 pixels high, then all of a sudden, seeing that I've read to 3,000 pixels and you've read to 2,000 means very different things, right? So, so scroll doesn't really let us compare between users or kind of compare between sites or between pages. Um, and, and I think that this, this engaged time actually sort of uh, captures a little bit of both, right? So it lets us, it gives us something that has statistical signal. It also gives us something that can be compared across users, right? So you see that, you know, uh, if I spend 30 seconds reading a page and you spend 45, we really have had different experiences. We've probably consumed different, different amounts of content. Um, okay, so what can we do with that? So the first thing, ooh, this is actually, uh, a reordered version. Okay, so the first thing that we can do is uh, is ask what stories uh, people actually spend time on, right? So you can think about the quality of a headline as as measuring, you know, kind of how how attractive an article is. But once people get into an article, do they actually read it, right? So what I did is is I pulled tens of millions of sessions from across uh, the last two and a half months, so since July first. Um, across a variety of sites, and then I, I pulled uh, for words that show up in the headline, whether or not there was a high fraction of, of people actually reading the story that the headline linked to, right? Um, on the left, we have the, the stories that people actually demonstrate engagement on, and on the right, we have the stories that people uh, didn't engage with. I pulled this not really thinking that there would be something kind of interesting in here. This actually is so clean that it's sort of stunning, right? So I think when you look at these stories on the right, we all know what these stories are, right? Just looking at these one words in the headline, you think about like, okay, the top, you know, colleges, the best companies, whatever, right? And, and these really are the stories that you click to accidentally because they show up in, you know, some, uh, you know, promoted advertisement in your Facebook feed or something, and then you're like, oh, wait, I didn't mean to click that, and you come back, right? Um, so, uh, 
so so it shows us that that y y there really is some sort of semantic segmentation that's that's interesting and and uh, and it's interesting you know this is at a very broad scale where we're talking about across you know a, a hundreds and hundreds of sites but but looking at one specific site you get the same sort of interesting trend um, to sort of I'm gonna just like drag back a little bit so now let's look at um, the quality of traffic rather than on a specific story the quality of traffic from a specific referrer so here what we're looking at is how much time people spend on a page conditioned on where they came from right um, and I'm showing these histograms kind of one after the other so because they all look sort of similar side by side but if you if you move through them you can see how the shapes change so first of all so these are people who are coming from search these are people who are coming from internal sources. So they're coming to an article from the homepage or from some other part of the site. These are people who are coming from social sources. And these are people who are coming from external links. Right? So there's, there's kind of something interesting here, which is what we see is, is that people who are coming from recommendations, either from other sites or from you know, the, their friends in the social media sphere, spend dramatically more time reading those articles than people who are coming from, let's say, the homepage, right? The homepage of a site. Um, so that tells us that, that those sources somehow, uh, you know, when you click on a link from, from a social source, you're, you're kind of, you have more predisposition to actually read it. This is sort of correcting for already for bias where you know, it might be that the best stories are the ones shared on social. So, so we're correcting for that in this figure. Um, but the interesting thing is that if we sort of flip this around um, and ask not, you know, how much time people spend on, on a page, but how frequently it is that they return, you get a really different story. So, so people who come to a source, uh, come, come to a page from, from a social source or from an external source uh, are only maybe 20% uh, likely to actually return to the site sometime in the next seven days. People who are coming to a, to a page from an internal source, uh, like you know, coming from the home page, uh, are frequently over 50% likely to return to the site in the next week. And so the point is that, that there's this kind of uh, balance between you know, people, have, people reading stories really thoroughly and, uh, and, and people actually returning to the site. Um, to flip around, in here for just a second. Um, on the other hand, if we correct for the amount of time, for, for where people come from, right? So if you take a representative sample of people, then what you see is that across the board, so conditioned on coming from Facebook, the people who come from Facebook are much more likely to return to a site than the people who spend, sorry, conditioned on coming from Facebook, the people who spend more time are more likely to come back. Conditioned on, on coming from internal links, the people who spend more time are more likely to come back. So, so I think the, the conclusion is somewhat subtle, that social sources, external sources, people are more likely to spend time, but, uh, but if, if you're thinking about sort of people's propensity to return, it, it, it really is dependent on you know, the, the outliers in terms of spending the most time within a traffic source makes you, makes you the more, most likely person to return. Um, so with that uh, kind of list of topics, I'm gonna uh, conclude. I don't know if there are any questions. This isn't the best uh, venue for questions necessarily, but any, uh, any questions? All right, uh, well, uh, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. Cool.